Festival Mediterraneo tal-letteratura ta' Malta. Il-tema tal-lum hija is universality a myth, the case for literature. Il-diskussjoni se titmexxa min David Aloysio, miħu fil-panel għanna erba uturi mitnax prezenti għal dan il-festival. Il-Maltin li jaqsma ħajjetun bejna un uxim kien jihar, Antman Kassar u Loren Vella, Anna lil Eric Ingal Charles, li twila tilkamerun u jiex Wales, u lil Habib Tengur, imwilet l-Algerija u jiex Franza. Nadja Mitsud seta' di lil wall ta interpretu għal Tengur. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Venezia Med, I would like to welcome you for the launch of the 14th edition of the Malta Mediterranean Literature Festival. We decided to kickstart this year's festival by discussing Is Universality a Myth? The Case for Literature. This discussion will be moderated by David Aloysio. The other panel members are four of the 12 invited authors for this year's festival. The Maltese authors who write in Maltese but live and work away from the island, Antoine Cassar and Loren Vella, the Cameroonian born and currently a Welsh resident, Eric Ingal Charles, and Habib Tengur, an Algerian currently living in France. Nadia Mipsoud will be acting as an interpreter. David, I hand over the mic to you. Thank you. I welcome you to the first discussion of our festival. Lately, this week, I was reading a review of Trojan by Alex Vallagera, who's here, and I, I read this comment written by Juan Pablo Sayed. Maltese intolerance can be well read as world intolerance. And somehow, this statement is connected to what we're going to discuss today. Today, we are going to discuss a particular quality in literary works, that of universality. Is it achievable, as Sayez is suggesting, or it is just a myth? We will explore this theme together with our prestigious panel here. Um, uh, if you want, we can, uh, we can introduce, you can introduce yourselves. Just a quick introduction, please, Eric. <coughs> um, good evening. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Eric Ngale Charles. Eric is a name my mother calls me when I've done something wrong. <laughs> that could be a myth. She calls me Ngale when she wants to give me positive chastisement. You know, I'm very, very happy to be in Malta. Um, I'm going to share a story with you at some point. <laughs> uh, thank you, David, for, for chairing this session, and thanks to everybody for coming. And so my name is Antoine Castel. I mostly write poetry. Uh, I used to write in the multilingual, and a few years ago I switched to the monolingual, Maltese, and I'll leave it at that for now. Um, good evening. Um, this is Laurent Vella. Um, I write in Maltese, um, I think in Maltese, and uh, I'm very happy to be here, but I'm speaking in English, but anyway, we'll be talking about that. Um, yeah, I'll just stop here. Leila uh, Tayeba, good evening, bonsoir. Je parlerai en français, I'll speak in French, and Nadia will translate, because for me it's easier to, yeah, to tell what I have to tell, what I have to say, to say what I have to say. Thank you. I would 
would like to initiate this discussion by quoting from Pascal Casanova's preface of her book, The Republic of Letters. I'm quoting, the purpose of this book is to restore a point of view that has been obscured for the most part of the nationalization of literatures and literary histories to rediscover a lost transnational dimension of literature that for 200 years has been reduced to the political and linguistic boundaries of nations. In what follows then, I will speak not of world literature, but of international literary space, or else of the world republic of letters." End quote. Do you concur with Casanova's idea of understanding literature in this universal dimension? Is this a freeing exercise, or is it a very simplistic approach to a much broader reality? I hope you understood my, <laughs> my question. Eric. In a simpler way, I, I ask you if you if you if you concur with the, if you want, agree with the idea of understanding literature in this universal dimension. Uh, thank you very much for posing that question. When um, Jean Paul sent me that question, I thought to myself, "Oh my gosh!" You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm a poet, I'm a playwright. I can whatever drum you play, I can dance to it. But answering to some questions like this they are very technical. So. I'm going to answer this by telling you two stories. I think universality is not a myth, it's something that is achievable. In 2001, I was invited to a conference in Klanditno. It was organized by a company called Literature Wheels. And until 2001, I had not heard of the word trauma, or what it means to be traumatized, or the triggers of trauma. But I met this fascinating girl, and if you read some of my work, I, I, I use her as my, um, I, I've created a new version of her. Her name is Fazana, and Fazana was from Afghanistan. Fleeing from Afghanistan, Fazana was with her mom and her father. So by the time they reached Uzbekistan, Fazana's father died. In order to pay the human traffickers, Fazana's mother had to prostitute herself. So by the time they reached the Bosphorus in, in Istanbul, Fazana's mother became blind. As Fazana was telling this story, I was thinking to myself, maybe Fazana's mother's blindness was it, she, she wanted to be blind. So I asked myself, can blindness be desired? If so, what have those eyes seen to desire to see no more? And then I started remembering an old fable, a myth that my mother told me about the rituals of a stick insect. Now, the stick insect in my language is called the molikilikili. Now, on the side of my mother's kitchen, there's a huge Iroko tree. It's the biggest tree in sub-Saharan Africa. But every morning, on the side of this tree, there's a small insect, stick insect, stick insect on the side of this tree. And it is pushing this tree day in, day out. But no one stops to ask the stick insect what it is doing to this tree, until one day, a millipede stops and inquires, excuse me, what are you doing to this tree? So the stick insect stands around to the, to the millipede and says, you see, this tree has been blocking my son for 4,000 years. I am going to push this tree until it falls to the ground. So the millipede shakes its head and walks away. Three months later, on its way back, the stick insect is still pushing this tree. So the millipede does something, which I think Fazana's mother did, and she said, Evonda wata te wa kowa wa mawe, wa rumelele te wa wo wandi malua, riwa wele na tati wunde o manu, ruelele na weli mo o munye. Enulea matu, enulea miro, narawea wea wea ma molikili kama, the millipede prays to the gods, it begs the gods, it asks the god to render it blind and deaf because it did not want to see what the stick insect was doing to this tree. So can blindness be desired? If so, what have those eyes seen to desire to see no more? Now, is that not something that has a universal significance? Thank you very much. answer your question. Um, I haven't read Casanova's work, 
but fr from I came across it as I was preparing for today's today's um, uh, debate. And uh, as as far as I know, Casanova is more in the line of Moretti no? in um, speaking of of distant reading and looking for patterns across uh, works in different languages and cultures and so on. Um, I feel I would make. There, there are so many. I think we will leave here with more questions than answers about universality, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I mean, how do you define universality, first of all? Who decides? That's a very important question. Um, sometimes or often, you may hear or read the accusation that universal literature or world literature, that's just um, what the West decides the global canon should be. And I think that there is truth in that accusation. Um, maybe the very idea that there is a universal literature in the first place, that there can be one, like the very I idea that it exists as a phenomenon, maybe that is also a European or Western idea. Um, and then beyond the question of nomenclature, Right? What is universal, what is planetary, the canon, the masterpiece, and so on. Um, thinking as a reader and writer, not only of, of poetry, I would make a distinction between four different types or phases of universality. Right? The first, I, said, I mentioned four, but I'm going to start with the number zero on purpose for a good reason. So uh, number zero is universality of intent. When a writer sits down and uh, starts ruminating on what they're going to write, if they have the intention of trying to write something universal, um, it's a noble kind of um, wish to have, but it's all, it's all, it also implies a certain amount of arrogance, and you need to have a, a certain amount of experience to even begin to think about trying to write something universal. But most of the time, and I speak a little bit from experience from what I used to write 10 years ago, if you try to be universal from the very start and concentrate more on form, for example, than content or theme, you will most probably fail. Then, so that was number zero. Number one is uh, the universality of the nature of a work. Um, which goes beyond form. The two major themes of what I was about to say world literature, <laughs> universal literature, the two major themes of literature, let's just call it that, are love and death. And then there are there's everything in between. For me, a piece of work that, is u that has universal appeal uh, will speak about human relationships, um, maybe about a social struggle. It could be based in a very particular place, but will apply to other places. Um, family relationships as well. Emotions like jealousy, rivalry, war. These are all universal concepts, universal feelings. Then the second, well, third, but it's number two, type of universality is the univer is universality of reception and circulation of a piece of work. And that's out of the author's hands. Um, what makes a piece of work universal today can depend a lot on the markets. I use markets in the plural because literature uh, it tends to be um, compartmentalized in, a, in, a na in national frameworks, and there are national book fairs and national competitions and national ways of thinking about how to produce a, a book that's translated. And speaking of translation, without translation, of course, that second or third type of universality would be impossible. And then the last one, number three, um, 
is when a piece of work that has become more or less universal through translation becomes universal over time, when it transcends, uh, when it's been written and so on. Thank you for your comprehensive answer. Thank you. A bit academic, maybe. <laughs> The, the word universal is, is so big that it can be scary. And when I received the title of this evening's talk, uh, I, I felt that I couldn't, under, um, I couldn't answer the question, is universality a myth? I don't think that as a, I feel that as a writer, I don't have uh, the ability to answer that question. It, it's too big for me. Uh, but still, I had to think about this question. and. I ended up thinking about the fact that, as a writer, I, um, I write for, I, I, as a writer, I am a human being, and I'm writing for a reader who is also a human being. And that is basically what we have in common. We are human beings, and we are, and I am writing about anything that makes us human, and the reader is reading about things that make us human, and it could be anyone reading what I write. So I was thinking a lot about this idea that uh, literature is made up of these two processes, that of writing and that of reading. And uh, they are connected, and you need both to have, to have the, the literary experience. And the, I asked myself the question, is, is this universality the responsibility of the writer, as a writer, should I be writing something that concerns every single human being present and in the future? Because obviously, uh, a work of literature can be read much later than when it was written. And, or rather, is it the responsibility of the reader during the reading process to make his reading a universal kind of reading in the sense that when you read a work, depend, it doesn't matter um, when it was written, if it was written five years ago or a hundred years ago, can I still make it applicable to my, as a reader, can I still make it applicable to my situation here and now? So these are the questions that I ask, and I don't have an answer. I, I feel that I can think about these things, but I cannot give an answer. So that, that is um, the first thing that I, was, that I confirmed, that I, that I could be certain of, that I do not have an answer to this question. Secondly, as a, as a writer, I feel that in the act of writing, every single word that I write, I am creating a kind of perfect reader for the, this kind of work. So I am not only creating the work, but I'm also creating the ideal reader. And it's, a, it's like an amalgam of a lot of readers. Uh, it's not a real person, so I'm not writing for, a, for an actual person or a, an actual group of people, but I'm writing for someone. I'm creating that someone who would be able to read it in the best possible way. Then, on the other hand, uh, the reader, during the act of reading, is also recreating himself as a, as a reader. I, I feel this because I, am, I feel that I am both a reader and a writer. And when I'm reading a work, when I, when I open a, a novel, and it's a, it, I'm reading the first few pages, and the, the first few pages are always really tricky because I, I don't know how I am going to read this work. Uh, I have to sort of uh, find a comfortable way of reading this work. It's like sitting down on a, on, a, on a couch and you're trying to, you know, 
find the right position to feel to, to enjoy sitting down on this couch. But sometimes it takes it takes a while, and that's the first few chapters of a, of a work feels like that. And then halfway through, I feel that I'm so comfortable that this work is speaking to me, or maybe not. But you know, so there is this. Um, creative process, both as a reader and as a writer, um, which is apart from the literary work itself. It's about reading, how to read this work. And this is maybe the closest it can, it can come to, to this idea of universality in the sense that if I'm reading something that was written in a time when things were completely different to, to my reality, I can still pick uh, certain aspects that I can read into the, the work, and then it becomes applicable to me. This is the closest it, it can get. You, I don't believe you can actually write a work that is uh, significant in the same way and applicable in the same way to every single person that exists today and in the future. It, I mean, it's, uh, it's too big to, to be able to say that. But if you can, uh, th there are works that speak to more people than other works, obviously. So. Le la citation de Pascal Casanova, me semble-t-il, renvoie à la situation de la littérature en France et euh, des problèmes qui étaient soulevés par les écrivains dits francophones. Parce que euh, dans les années 80, bon, il y a eu tout un mouvement, d'ailleurs il y a eu un manifeste qui a été signé par euh, un certain nombre d'écrivains très connus puisque ça datait en 1987 plusieurs prix euh, ont été attribués à des auteurs qui n'étaient pas français de souche. Okay. So I think that the quotation from Casanova reflects the situation of uh, French literature. Uh, especially uh, the situation of francophone so uh, writers, which means that um, writers writing in French but not necessarily living in France or uh, French-born. Uh, especially in the 1980s, there was a manifesto which was signed by several uh, writers um, because of prizes, literary prizes that were awarded to um, francophone readers, the writers, but writers who were not born and raised in France. Ces auteurs se voulaient dans la littérature monde. La littérature monde, en fait, est une vieille notion que Goethe avait déjà dit avant, dit Welt littérature, mais eux, ils ne citaient pas Goethe. Donc, pour d'autres raisons, je reviendrai sur la citation de Goethe. Par littérature monde, ils entendaient que le français écrit par des auteurs qui n'étaient pas français de souche, d'origine maghrébine, de l'Afrique subsaharienne, du Canada, de la Belgique, etc., puissent exprimer dans la langue française le monde. Pour les français, seuls les français et Paris, puisque c'est Paris qui donne... C'est euh, les auteurs qui étaient chez les grands éditeurs parisiens et qui étaient français de souche, ou bien quand certains auteurs étaient très importants, comme Ionesco, Beckett euh, et d'autres, ils devenaient français. Rousseau, tout ça, deviennent français. Tandis que les autres restent toujours des francophones. Et c'est ce problème-là qui était posé. Comment le français allait-il être la langue d'une littérature monde, ce que Daniel Casanova appelle la république universelle des lettres. Okay. So, 
these writers, so we're talking about the francophone writers, they believed in what they called la littérature monde, which is like world literature, and what they were actually quoting uh, Goethe without, uh, without knowing it, or without actually quoting him explicitly, who talked about Weltliteratur. And the main question was this. The main question was, how could you uh, use French um, to actually describe the world or write about the world? Um, if you were coming from the Maghreb, if you were coming from Canada, if you were coming from an African country, um, how could you do that when the French writers themselves, and by French writers we mean those living in Paris, the Parisian writers, um, they consider that they are the only ones who can do that. So to, to French writers, you can only write the world in French if you are being, if you are a writer who is published by um, great publishers. The only exceptions, of course, were authors like, world famous authors, like for example, Beckett or Ionesco. And these exceptions then were, became French, they were integrated into the French tradition and were considered as French. But for the other Francophone writers, this was their battle, this was the big question. How can you write the world in French if you are Francophone, but not French-born or French-raised? Bon, uh, on peut débattre de cette question. En fait, uh, l'universalité de la littérature est à la fois un mythe et une réalité. Uh, C'est une notion occidentale de toute façon. Déjà, Marx, en 1848, dans le manifeste, montre très bien que la, civil... la mission civilisatrice du capital, le capital dominant le monde, l'Angleterre et la France notamment, par des colonies, etc., les littératures locales n'ont plus de place et on a une littérature universelle qui va progressivement voir le jour. Donc la domination capitaliste, c'est une réalité. Aujourd'hui, le monde, à partir... En fait, l'histoire commence dès le XVIe siècle. La conquête de l'Amérique, petit à petit, la découverte de l'autre. Déjà l'Europe, en fait, quand on parle de littérature universelle, pourquoi c'est seule la France et l'Angleterre étaient universelles au XVIIe siècle, c'était ça. L'Angleterre et la France, la, la littérature, c'est les deux littératures universelles. Les autres, elles avaient failli la Renaissance en Italie, mais ça n'a pas été. L'Espagne, c'était trop particulier. Et l'Allemagne n'avait pas encore, et c'était le français qui était écrit, parlé en Russie, en Allemagne, etc. Et ce n'est pas un hasard si Goethe à cette idée de la littérature universelle parce que l'Allemagne était déjà, se sentait dominée et voulait sortir de cette domination culturelle de la France. Ok, so the idea of uh, literature being universal is both a myth and a reality. Uh, it's actually a very Western idea, a Western notion. Um, and it goes, back to, uh, it goes back to the 16th century. Um, in the 16th century, for example, with, uh, with the discovery of America, which also means the discovery of the other with a capital O, um, Back then, actually, it was only France and uh, English literature that were considered as universal. Um, the Italian literature um, was important at a point in time, but then it kind of um, weakened. The Spanish literature uh, was too particular to be, to be considered as universal. And in 1848, Karl Marx in his manifesto was already talking about 
the capitalist domination, about the fact that there was a global economy which was actually threatening uh, a national literature. So there was no room for a national literature. And when, when, when Goethe was writing, um, he wanted to actually release himself from the domin domination of um, the French cultural tradition. Je, je continuerai après. <laughs> I would like to thank the panel for these comprehensive answers. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on for another quotation by Robert E. Hemingway. The black author must transcend race in order to write universally. Even such a brilliant poet as Gwendolyn Brooks has been advised that if being a Negro is her subject, then she is somehow prevented from creating great literature. So, end quote. Sometimes in certain literary work, works, racism emerges from deep and typically hidden assumptions about whiteness as universal. There are no obvious racial slurs. This is a kind of racism that is difficult to expose because it is passive. Do you think that the universal experience we're talking about perpetuates white male-centered standards, experiences, and culture? Eric. You see, uh, again, I'm not avoiding that question. I'm going to answer it on a technicality. See, by the time I was 12 years old, I could recite King Richard II, Act 1, Scene 2. Alas, the part I had in Woodstock's blood doth more solicits me than your exclaims to stay against the butchers of his life. But since correction lies in those hands which made the fault, place we our quarrels in the wheels of heaven, whom when they see the hours ripe on earth will rain hot vengeance on the offender's head. By the time I was in Upper Six, I know about kids. Um, Oh, oh hill, um, the, birds, the, the, the leaves have withered from the trees and no bird sings. Until I came to Wales, I had never heard of a Cameroonian writer. Until I went back to Cameroon in 2017. Then I met people like Mbela Sune Dipoko. Then I met, so once upon a time, there was this narrative that um, those who spearheaded empires had legitimacy when it came to literature. And people like uh, Cameroonians, for example, Anglophone and Francophone, who were made to think that unless you can quote Shakespeare, unless you can quote John Keats. In fact, I memorized the whole of King, King Richard, uh, not King Richard, King Lear, all of these things. So I never knew about Melasone because then what, what I started realizing is once we've achieved this idea of uh, universality, in which language are poets going to write? And I'm going to do a small poem for you so that you can determine to yourself. Ma 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 we longi anenji alene. Tata ma we longi anenji alene. Wa manu kato moli me koli koli ribe yaru. Rina muko moli me koli koli rina be yaru. Rina ne juju ke na me vimi wane ya ene re ya mango. My mother said. Ngale, when the field is ready, fill your basket to the brim. Carry it on your back. Walk to the top of the hill. When you reach the top of the hill, do not sigh. Do not show any signs of tiredness. I was a boy. My bones were soft. I was weak. I reached the top of the hill. I sat upon a tree trunk. I fell asleep. In my sleep, I saw the devil, Mevomba, and his friends, Jukuke, who showed me all my trials and tribulations. In my sleep, I saw my grandmother. She was rearranging the words on my grave. Ngale is here. Ngale is no more. She arranged the flowers on my grave. In my sleep, I saw young boys. I saw young girls. They were dancing bare feet in the rain. In my dream, I saw bees. Bees pregnant with nectar carried me home, away from exile. Mama ma we longi anenji alene. Tata ma we longi anenji alene. Wa manu kato moli me koli koli rikuyaru. 
Rina moko moli me koli koli rina kwe yaru. Rina ene juju kena mevembe wane ya ene re ya mango. Yes, I saw bees pregnant with nectar carrying me home away from exile. Thank you very much. Your, your question was about um, the Western view of universal literature, right? As a, a, a racial view of it as well, okay? Um, so, I mean, one example of one of my favorite poetry books of all time is uh, Rabindranath Tagore's Gitanjali. Um, he was from um, West Bengal in India, but and he wrote in Bengali, but he also wrote in English. And if I'm not mistaken, the Gitanjali were written directly in English. And I believe that it's considered a piece of world literature, partly because of the fact that he decided to write in English, right? Um, I, I was surprised to hear what Habib was saying uh, about Spanish literature not being considered universal in the 16th and, and 17th centuries. Because uh, I think I, I don't think it took Don, Don, the Don Quixote, Don Quixote, so long to be to be translated and so on and to be appreciated. But I'm not saying that to um, contradict Habib. It's an interesting example of how something that can be considered universal today won't be universal anymore tomorrow. But it might be again the day after tomorrow. So once a work goes through the gates of, uh, of St. Peter into the heaven of universality, there is no guarantee that it will stay there. And I also want to latch on to something that Loran was talking about. You mentioned the ideal reader. And I'd like to hear more about the, re the responsibility of the reader in universalizing a work, because that, that puts a lot of pressure on the reader. You know? um, of course, it, eventually it's a transnational readership that decides whether a work can be considered universal or not. But going back to the ideal reader, uh, Italo Calvino speaks about the ideal reader in Se una notte d'inverno un viaggiatore. And um, Calvino also has a book which could be considered a classic in itself. It's a book called, um, f I think it's 14 reasons why we read the classics. No, or it's why do we read the classics, and he gives 14 different reasons. Yeah? I'm not going to go through all 14 of them. The most quoted one is number six, when he says, um, a classic is a book which has never exhausted all it has to say to its readers. It's like a mine. You can continue like an infinite mine. You know? And One of my favorites, the most personal of those 14 criteria given by Calvino is number 11. So your, your as in you the reader, your classic is a book to which you cannot remain indifferent and which helps you define yourself in relation or even in opposition to it. So this is something that I forgot to mention, uh, when I was going through the types of universality, um, how easily and how profoundly a reader, or a, let's say a transnational collective of readers, um, identify with a book um, greatly determines how universal it can be considered. Uh, speaking of Italo Calvino, I, I would like to quote something by Calvino when he, he was, um, his question was, whom do we write for? And he says that every book, not only of literature, um, even if addressed to someone, is read by its addressees and by its enemies. It is perfectly possible that the enemies might learn more from it than the addressees. And this links to what you were saying in the sense that um, a work 
we have to keep in it's important to keep in mind the intention of the writer when writing the work. Was there a, a, a political intention? Uh, was there a, a racist intention to write uh, um, the, wh whatever was written? And then the intention of the reader, but the reader can be the individual reader, but it could be also the society as a reader and the authority as a reader, the power. Um, the, the the body that holds power and would like to push a, a literary work uh, as its manifesto, for example. Um, so I would keep, again, I don't have uh, an answer to, to your question. I, I find these, um, these um, I don't consider these questions as such when I'm, when I'm writing in the sense that I do have my own agenda when writing, but it's it's um, uh, sort of I, I am not a uh, I am not very political, uh, not uh, not an not a political activist perhaps, but whatever I have to say, I say it in my own writing. So obviously there is a there is an intention uh, in that, but then it can or it might not be taken up by the reader. So it's very important to see what is taken up by the reader on a small scale and by the readers on a, on a much bigger scale. Uh, and, and, I, and I think on this subject, this is all I would like to say. It depends, uh, because if it's, I mean, obviously the reader will see whatever he wants to see. Again, um, I, I have, Italo Calvino is brilliant to, to quote in these situations because he says that everyone mines every book for the things that are useful to him. So one single literary work can be taken up by a group of people uh, upholding a philosophical belief and by their opponents, it depending on how you want to read uh, a particular work. So I would say, is the author responsible for what is read? At a certain, you know, once it's out there, it's no longer, uh, it doesn't belong to the author anymore. The reading aspect, the reading process does not belong to the author anymore. So anything can happen even the exact opposite of what the author intended when he or she wrote whatever they wrote. So it's, it's two different realities. Uh, and we have to keep this in mind when we are talking about um, whether a work is offending someone or not, or if it's not including uh, a particular group of people or not. So was it the intention of the author? Was it the, is it the intention of the work? Because a work has also a, this, uh, it's also, auto to a certain extent, it can be autonomous of the writer himself. It can say, it can actually end up saying the opposite of what the writer wanted to say. And then obviously, the, 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 this would be the middle phase and then, obviously, then it depends on what the, right, the, the readers see and, and what they are reading. So I think this is how I see this whole business. Je ne pense pas que l'universel soit une question de race, mais plus de culture. Or, il se trouve que il y a deux cultures qui se sont toujours dites universelles. C'est la culture occidentale judéo-chrétienne et la culture musulmane qui ont voulu imposer leur vision du monde qui est une vision totale. Les autres cultures, bon, elles ne se considéraient pas comme universelles, mais il se trouve que dans cette universalité, euh, au Moyen-Âge, euh, les Arabes, la culture arabe, était tellement importante, ils ont traduit les Grecs, ils ont traduit la, les, les, les Indiens, les Chinois, etc. Parce que quand une culture se prend comme étant universelle, elle va vouloir intégrer tout ce qui lui, va lui servir chez les autres. 
c'est-à-dire elle va traduire des autres cultures. Les Romains vont, vont prendre les Grecs, ils vont prendre, et, et c'est et, et à l'intérieur d'une vision qu'ils vont développer cette universalité. Il se trouve que c'est l'Occident qui domine le monde à partir du 19e siècle. Et c'est donc l'Occident qui va, même si Goethe, dans, quand il parle de Welt littérature, dit qu parce qu'il commençait à s'intéresser à un roman chinois, il trouve qu'il y a des choses intéressantes dans ce roman chinois, il trouve qu'il y a des choses intéressantes dans les sagas scandinaves, etc. Et que, dit-il, tous les peuples ont cette, euh, quelque chose qui les pousse vers la littérature. Mais si on veut aller vers quelque chose de neuf, il faut entrer dans une littérature monde et donc traduire. Et je pense qu'avec le 19e siècle, enfin déjà au 18e, 19e siècle, ce que l'Occident va imposer au monde comme genre universel, c'est le roman. Le roman au détriment de la poésie. Tous les peuples, même les peuples qui n'ont pas de langue écrite dans l'oralité, ont une poésie. Mais le roman, c'est le, le roman français et anglais qui vont dominer le monde. Après, il y aura le roman russe, le roman américain, etc. Et on s'aperçoit d'une chose, c'est quelle est la thématique, surtout quand on est un auteur du Sud, comme on dit aujourd'hui, donc de pays dominés, comment intéresser, comment intéresser l'Occident qui, lui, est universel Comment, si on écrit dans une langue qui n'est pas considérée comme une grande langue, encore faut-il être traduit, et être traduit dans les langues qui sont connues dans le monde entier Et quel thème aborder pour être dans l'universel Et c'est toute la problématique de la domination aujourd'hui, parce qu'on est dans un monde dominé. Et ceux qui arrivent à s'en sortir, regardons, les Japonais... On ne connaissait rien du Japon avant la Seconde Guerre mondiale, ou très peu de choses. Après, avec le développement économique du Japon, le cinéma japonais, la littérature japonaise, mais moi, quand j'étais étudiant, la Chine, à part Mao Zedong, on ne savait rien de la Chine. Et aujourd'hui, tout d'un coup, on découvre un cinéma chinois, une littérature chinoise, l'Inde, c'est pareil, alors que ces pays-là avaient leur propre littérature, avaient des choses, des monuments. Mais l'Occident ne commence à s'y intéresser qu'au moment où ils deviennent des puissances économiques et où, justement, ce rapport, c'est-à-dire qu'on ne peut pas parler de littérature sans parler de l'état du monde et de la domination. Aujourd'hui, qu'on le veuille ou non, déjà ça, et, et ce, qui, ce qui va se passer, me semble-t-il, c'est pourquoi la poésie est un peu Reléguée. La poésie, personne ne s'y intéresse, ou très peu de gens. D'abord, elle est difficile à traduire, etc. Donc, on va dire, ah non, la poésie, mais le roman, le roman oui, et, et, et de plus en plus, l'écriture même du roman. On le voit, par exemple, avec l'Europe. L'Europe, euh, les écrivains européens, un roman qui sort doit être traduit dans le mois, si on veut être un grand écrivain européen. Et donc, l'écriture, pour être traduite rapidement, ce n'est pas du Joyce. C'est une écriture, effectivement, qui va être traduite dans le moi. Et donc, il va y avoir des choses qui font que cette universalité, me semble-t-il, est un leurre, quand on parle d'universalité. Le leurre, c'est de faire croire que la culture de masse, ce qui se vend, ce qui est traduit partout, les grands auteurs, les best-sellers, c'est ça, l'universalité. Et là, je, pour moi, je pense que toute la difficulté, toute la difficulté, c'est comment maintenir dans sa propre langue une littérature, une poésie qui puisse rendre compte de l'humain aujourd'hui, même si on n'arrive pas à la traduire tout de suite. Mais le temps viendra où elle sera traduite. Le problème, c'est de ne pas désespérer dans son écriture. Or, toute la difficulté, c'est le marché qui domine aujourd'hui. I'm not taking orders from you. <laughs> no. Okay. So, I think that 
universality is not a question of race, it's a question of culture. And once again, I believe that uh, the dominant culture is the Western one with the uh, Judeo-Christian uh, tradition and the Muslim tradition on the other side. Uh, both of them wanting to kind of impose their vision of the world. Uh, if we take the example of uh, what happened uh, in the Arab-speaking world in the Middle Ages when uh, they translated the Greeks, the Indians, the Chinese, this gives us already a clear view of uh, when, when a culture wants to become a dominant culture, then what it does is it um, kind of inserts into its own culture, it takes whatever it thinks is important from other cultures and makes it its own. Um, so for example, um, Goethe again in the 19th century was talking about uh, Chinese works, about Chinese novels. He was talking about Scandinavian sagas. And um, he was saying that he believes that everybody, every, every nation um, has something, there is something in every nation that pushes it towards literature. And that's why, uh, the, therefore, the importance of word literature, of a word literature. But to have a word literature, you need something new. And how do you get this word literature? You get it through translation. And so um, he says that in the 18th century, uh, there's the emergence of the novel as being the dominant genre. Um, and obviously, poetry then was kind of put away, whereas poetry before was an oral tradition which was important in all cultures. Um, but in French literature, in English literature, all of a sudden, the novel became the dominant genre. And so the big question here, especially for writers, uh, what we call in French les auteurs du sud, which means writers coming from the southern hemisphere, or the southern part of the world, um, how, can you, how can you make your work interesting for um, a universal readership? How can you make it interesting for the whole world uh, when um, there is this kind of domination? And there's also a link that we need to consider about what um, about the, the economic market. So obviously, places like Japan or China, they already ha had a rich cultural tradition. But in the Western world, we didn't know much about it. When did we start knowing about it? It was when they became important, um, important figures, economically speaking. So when they became economic powers. So I think that literature actually reflects the state of the world today. Why is poetry, why is poetry considered as um, a difficult genre? Because it is difficult to translate, because it doesn't sell well. And what makes today, if we, if we look at the, at, the, at the market as far as novels are concerned, what is considered as a good novel? A good novel is one that has been translated into other languages within a month after it's being published. So here there is a kind, this is tricky because what we are made to believe is that good literature is this mass literature that we're getting, which means all these works that are translated as soon as they are published and that become accessible. So for Habib here, the big issue is how do you manage to create in your own language something which poetically can give a clear idea of what 
hum, hum, being human means. He says it's difficult, but one should not despair. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Habib and Nadia. I would like to elaborate on this, on the issue of translation. The process of univer universalization implies translation in the language of the other. Eva Hoffman in her memoir, Lost in Translation, writes about emigrating from Poland to Vancouver at the age of 13 and encountering the shock of the new language. She writes, the words I learn now don't stand for things in the same unquestioned way they did in my native tongue. River, in Polish, was a, vi a vital sound energized with the essence of riverhood, of my rivers, of my being immersed in rivers. River, in English, is cold, a word without an aura. It has no accumulated associations for me, and it does not give off the radiating haze of connotation. It does not evoke." End quote. Do you think that Hoffman's confession strengthens the idea that a work of literature can never be universal since it can never be really translated? This time I wish to start with you, please. Thanks. I don't uh, like this traditore, traditore. It's not uh, real. Because translation, everything can be translated, but it needs time. C'est pour ça. C'est uh, l'universalité de l'œuvre n'est pas liée à la, tradu à la traduction directement. C'est Comment, une, de toute façon, quand les œuvres sont des œuvres importantes, Homer est traduit dans toutes les langues, Dante est traduit dans toutes les langues, les mille et une nuits sont traduits dans toutes les langues, la... Bah, euh, comment euh, bah, bah, ah, le, le livre de l'Inde, enfin, le... Non, Kamasutra, bah, alors Kamasutra est traduit aussi. Mais, bah, euh, ah, ça y est, ah, oui, ouais. bon, ça y est, ça, ça me reviendra. En plus, Peter Brooks l'a mis en scène. Donc, les grandes œuvres sont toutes traduites, même les œuvres orales, les sagas islandaises, les certaines œuvres de griots africains, euh, etc. Donc, la traduction n'est pas toujours trahison. La traduction est une recréation dans la langue d'arrivée de ce que l'on croit être la langue de départ. Okay, so the universality of a work is not I don't believe it is it it is or it should be. Um, linked to translation. Uh, if you take works, uh, for example, of Homer or Dante or the 1001 Nights, all these, what we consider as classics or, you know, this big literature, um, the Icelandic sagas, for example, uh, they have even the oral tradition, even that of some African gurus, all this has already been translated. Um, but it takes time. So I don't believe that when you're translating, you're, um, I believe that when you're translating, you are recreating, you are trying to render in another language what uh, was written originally. This is a very interesting subject for me for various reasons. One of them being that I'm also a translator, not a literary translator, but I translate uh, EU documents. Um, a few days ago, 
Kenneth, who is somewhere here taking photos probably, sent me a paragraph from my own novel, and he said, can you quickly translate this into English, because we need it for the, for the clip, video clip that came out today. And I was really busy, and I said, oh, I, I can't, I can't, I'm, I, I don't have time to do that. It was true, I was really busy, but there was another reason which I couldn't tell him, and I'm saying it now. I hate to translate my own work. I hate to translate my work from Maltese into English or any other language. Uh, not because I think that uh, it won't be good. Okay, I do think that I am a better writer in Maltese than in English, definitely, but that's not the reason why. The thing is that when I see my work translated into another language by someone else, I am very happy. I'm very excited to read. It's, I'm reading it as if it's, as if it's not mine. In fact, it's not. I believe that it's not. It's, it's, it's more of an interpretation. It's more of a, it's like when you, yeah, when you work with someone who gives you an idea and you decide to elaborate on that idea. So it's uh, like a, a joint, like a collaboration. And for me, translation is something like that. So when I, I, read, I read many authors in translation, obviously only when I cannot read the work in original, because obviously I feel that if I know the language, I should read the work in the original. But if I cannot, it's the next best thing. However, the next best thing should be as good as. And sometimes I believe that it takes a writer to be a good translator. Or else, if it's not a writer, it has to be someone who has the guts to read what is written and then rewrite it. If it's completely different, but it still retains the same emotion, the same feel, the same, you know, it, it evokes the same kind of feeling, then it is true it's not uh, it's not uh, a betrayal i know you've written the traduttore traditore there <laughs> it's not a betrayal translation i don't believe that translation is a betrayal i f i believe that a good translation is the one that moves away from the original to recreate something which works in this target language. If, you st if, if a translator tries to remain close and faithful to the original, there is, there is where it is betraying, because you are losing so much in translation. I mean, this, it's a cliche, lost in translation, it's a cliche, but unfortunately that is, is what happens most of the time. So yes, River can mean something else in a different language. So be it. Let's create a new emotion then. The, the translation, so the, the, uh, a work in another language is going to evoke different emotions in the readers. So when you are reading a translation, it's like reading a collaboration between two writers. There's the idea of the author who wrote it in the original language, and then there is this reworking of the translator into this new language. And also, you have to keep in mind that some works written a long time ago are being translated today. So what about that? Uh, when, when they are translated, they are also modernized, you know, they're make, they are being translated into the language of today, but they were not written in, in the, like the, the, the source language was not that of today. If it were written today, it would be, have been written completely in a completely different way. So there is a, a lot happening here. The, the process of translation is a very complex one. 
And uh, it's not a simple question. There's, a, there's a, a lot going on. However, translation, and for us Maltese, translation is very important because if we are not translated, we will only be read by a few hundred people. So we, uh, I think Antoine agrees with me that uh, f f f works in, in the Maltese language, they, they really need, they cry out to be translated. So obviously I would never complain about my work being translated and uh, reworked by, into another language. It is very important for us that coming from an island then, again, this, this isolation and the isolation of the language, it requires uh, a reworking into another language so as to move out. I would like to say three and a half things. <laughs> I'll start with the half because it's a correction of what I was saying before. Um, well, not really, not really a correction, just an addition. So I mentioned Gitanjali, I mentioned Tagore's Gitanjali as a world classic, as something that, a piece of work that's considered universal. And I said that part of the reason is because he wrote it in English. That's true. And also because he wrote it in a very musical English. But what I forgot to say is that uh, the Gitanjali were introduced to the English speaking world by Yeats. So the path of that book towards the world canon, or whatever we're going to call it, happened thanks to the approval of a Western, now classic author. OK. Um, in 2003, David Damrosch brought out a book called What is World Literature? And for Damrosch, works that thrive as world literature are ones that work well in translation and that even gain in translation. Now, how does a translation, how does a work work well in translation? Does that mean it has to be diluted, that it's a very accessible language and so easy to translate? that would imply that world, the world canon or world literature is diluted from the very beginning, right? But he also says that they even gain in translation. As Loran was saying, uh, the translator is not always a traitor, right? Um, a very good translator will not only reproduce the work in uh, their ideally native language, but they will continue to write the original, uh, not by adding a chapter or whatever. I mean, they continue to write it by uh, adapting metaphors, by filling in little blanks that maybe need to be put in because uh, the target culture needs them in order to understand parts of the original and so on. Um, translation, it's a form of creation, of continuing to create the original. So. The, the, Translators, they, they have that huge responsibility of, um, or maybe they don't, but they contribute to the world canon, not only by going from one language to another, but by putting in their own kind of poetic or literary effort. And um, so that was the half. That was one. Now I'm going to say two more things. And there's a question that maybe some of us in the audience are asking ourselves because we're talking about universality. And that question is or would be, can a Maltese literary work ever, if not become universal, enter the world canon or enter world literature? OK, M maybe it's not even important, right? But the reason I ask that question is because I, I now want to kind of not answer it, but walk towards an answer, firstly as an author, as a poet, and then as a translator. Okay, I'm going to speak about the export of Maltese literature now, right? So as, a, as an author, as a poet, um, an experience that I have 
sometimes when uh, I present a book or I read a poem in another country, in another language, and this is something I've heard from uh, other Maltese authors as well. It's very frustrating when uh, you're at a book fair or reading or whatever, and 90% of the questions from the audience or even from the other authors are about Malta, the history of Malta, the Maltese language, Maltese politics, and so on. Okay, context is important, but you don't always um, kind of detect any real interest in the work that you've actually read sometimes, right? Because they see you as the exotic writer from that tiny island in the Mediterranean that used to be a British colony, blah, blah, blah. Right? That's very frustrating sometimes. Um, so, and it can also depend on the work that you're, that you're presenting, right? So, um, I don't want to talk too much about my own work, that's not why I'm here, but uh, the, I, the, there is, if I read or recite the passport, for example, which is printed in the form of an anti-passport and it's about borders and uh, it's written in Maltese, but um, I wrote it in a way that perhaps it could, people could identify it from other borders or other border experiences. I, when I read the passport, I don't tend to get that question about the Maltese language or so on. Sometimes, yes, when they hear the original Maltese, but, but if I read any other poem, like about uh, childhood trauma or whatever, um, it's more likely that I'll be asked about Malta Maltese and so on, because they hear the language and they don't hear the message sometimes. So that's as an author. Now, as a, as a translator, um, two years ago I translated Alex Vellagera's uh, novel Trojan into Spanish, and earlier this year it was published in Chile, and so I went with Alex uh, to Chile and to Argentina to some book fairs to present the book. And um, we learned a lot. We learned a lot because um, at each of the presentations, there wasn't so much focus on the fact that we had come from a small island. It was, they were more interested in uh, the protagonist of, of, uh, of the novel as <coughs> a frustrated writer uh, whose frustration is translated into um, hate for everyone and everything and who becomes ultra conservative and because Latin America is uh, also has a, a very Catholic background many of the readers could identify with the story um, and I think that that translation of Troiano into Spanish um, it's just one example of how Maltese works can reach a greater circulation outside of, um, outside of Maltese and outside of Europe. Okay. Um, I think what we are doing right here, we're already demystifying that myth because when I go back to Wales, I'll speak of Maltese literature, and when I go to Cameroon, I'll do the same. You see, um, I love translation. And my first work was translated in Welsh in 2001 at the St. David's I Stedford. And I read it, it was far better than what I wrote. And um, Jean Paul has translated my poem, The Last Ritual in Mortis. I read it again, it is far better than what I wrote. Um, the problem comes again is when we come to this aspect of universality. Which language will take precedent? Are we going to forever be translating from English to French, Spanish to English, or Polish to English, that sort of thing? Um, and, and I, I speak broken languages, so I speak broken, uh, my, I speak far better Russian than I speak French. I speak broken English. The one language that I speak perfectly is Bakwiri. 
Bakwiri is it's a language, it's part of the Bantu language. But this is a language that I dream in. This is a language that when, I, when, I, in, when I'm in my room at night, I travel back to the range of my dreams and my broken landscape. Now, there, is a, there are two words in this Bakwiri language that, that fascinates me. Womba, W-O-M-B-A. If you translate this word Womba in English, it means the smiles of a sleeping child. Womba, the smiles of a sleeping child. The second word is Mbuanjoku. Um, Mbuanjoku translate, if you translate it in English, it means when it rains, it rains so hard, it feels as if elephants are falling on your roof. <laughs> so, so this is the problem with translation. Would you be able to capture that kind of trans that backward word, Mbuanjoku, perfectly in English, or perfectly in French? or perfectly in Maltese. And my, the, my, the great tragedy for me is, if I came in, in Malta and I stood outside there with my drum and I start playing, like, you will stop briefly and listen to me and then walk away. So I have to balance this, the language of my colonial masters and my dialect in order to achieve this aspect of universality. So I'm not going to go on about um, translation. I'm just going to do this. So again, you take what you want from it. And it makes sense. I think what you said is, is that um, for us as writers, we've written. And it's up to the readers to take whatever meaning they want to make out, take out of it. And if you wanted to go and translate it, that's fine. But Womba, 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 the smiles of a sleeping child. That's how I remember you. Um, in August, Mbuanjoku, when the rains came, we sit by the fire and watch as my mother cooked. When I was hungry and my mother wasn't home, I ate cocoa yams and red oil. When my sister was hungry and my mother wasn't home, I gave her cocoa yams and red oil. Womba, 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 the smiles of a sleeping child. That's how I remember you. Then my brother came. He said, Ngale, let's go to the forest. Let's carry firewood. I carry it on my head. My sister laughs. That's why you have a big head. My brother runs and hides under a mango tree and smokes a cigarette. I pray for my mother to catch him. She did. Womba, 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 the smiles of a sleeping child. That's how I remember you. We saw a black snake, a black mamba, I think. It licked its lips. We ran so fast our feet did not touch the ground. I met my brother by the river where the three villages met. He held my hands. He told me a story about a woman who lived on top of a tree. On that tree, there is a nest. In that nest, there is a feather. Womba, womba, womba. The smiles of a sleeping child. That's how I remember you. Okay. Um, I, have, I have plenty of questions left, but I will leave the space for, for you, for the audience. Um, uh, anyone wants to ask something, please? Direct you to the authors here. from this discussion is that universality has a lot to do with the transformative potential of, of a text, whether it's uh, uh, spatially, temporally, uh, by readers, which uh, ironically it would make it a myth because that's what myth does. Uh, I wanted to ask about the role of a specific kind of reader, the, the academic, and whether his or her work does contribute in the universality of a text. Thanks. Uh, uh, just a, a comment on it. You're, it's, you're right, and uh, uh, I would say that uh, the, the whole process of a literary work it starts with the writing 
uh, with, the, with the publishing of a work, with the reading of a work, and then with the criticism of the work. And that is very, very important because it, um, it sort of concludes the, the whole process and puts the work, uh, it sort of, it, it, it gives the work a value uh, which is beyond that kind of simply reading the work, but also saying like, what does it give to, to, the, to society in general? So I would say that uh, it has a very important role in, okay, you, we're talking about universality here, but it's not just about universality. It, it is a necessary element of the literary process. I don't have a definitive answer, right? Because, and, and I feel a bit uncomfortable um, answering this question because in a way I'm an academic because I have a PhD in literature and in a way I'm not because I don't work as an academic and I'm not sure I want to. But so I don't want to speak for academics or against them, right? But um, I think that they do play a very important role in um, kind of progressively and maybe not even very consciously deciding what the national or, or, or regional or world canon is. Between the market or the markets and the academics, I would prefer, I would prefer to <laughs> let the academics decide, but I'm still a bit skeptical about it. I think um, because the, the readership isn't really represented, not by the markets except through numbers, and not necessarily by academics because they will read a certain level of, of, of literature or, or they will read more academic uh, works. I don't know. I don't want to stereotype. No, I think um, it's always great to have criticism from those in academia. I think it's, it's relevant. It, it makes sense. Um, I just, I launched the first part of my autobiography on the 1st of June, and Jim Perrin, a wonderful Welsh writer who is also an academic, um, wrote, wrote a review of this book. But he never reviewed the book. He was just telling us about how he's been climbing mountains. And he took grudge with me because um, I didn't play with any colonial stereotype. I wrote about what I used to do as a child. One thing that I used to do as a child was go hunting. And we don't know the type of noises that animals make. So one day my brother and I went hunting and he did his sleeves up and he was putting his hands into a hole. And there was an animal in this hole that was making a particular noise. We were excited thinking that it was a rabbit. Until my, we were poking it. I, oh, it's very, very soft. This is not, so we're going to have some nice African pepper soup until my dog brought this animal out, and this was a, rhinoc a rhinoceros viper, one of the most dangerous snakes in, in sub-Saharan Africa. The only time I knew this snake made this, uh, this noise was when I came to Wales, and I was with, watching David Attenborough. And I went, oh my God, we were dicing with that. But then Jim Perrin picked on this, and said, oh, maybe that story is not authentic, because as an African, you should know the sounds of a snake. But you don't. We don't. <laughs> so if you are, you are going to offer criticism and um, um, bring uh, the relevance to universality, you should know what you are talking about. Uh, oui, je pense que les travaux académiques sur une œuvre sont importants pour la rendre, uh, disons, visible. Euh, il en faut beaucoup et là aussi euh, les universités euh, il y a des modes euh, tous les auteurs ne sont pas étudiés tous les auteurs ne sont pas appréciés et parfois euh, une œuvre peut circuler et peut trouver des lecteurs sans obligatoirement passer par euh, l'académie mais les lecteurs euh, disons privilégiés les lecteurs subtils sont de plus en plus rares 
Vous savez, si on prend la littérature au XIXe siècle, par exemple, Malarmé, ben, il n'y avait même pas 100 personnes qui avaient lu Malarmé autour de lui. Et c'est le plus grand poète de son époque. 100 personnes avaient découvert ou Rimbaud, Rimbaud, parce qu'il y avait Verlaine, ils étaient quelques-uns, euh, une vingtaine de personnes qui se réunissaient et ils s'étaient rencontrés. Mais c'était des lecteurs privilégiés. Aujourd'hui, on peut imaginer, effectivement, euh, mais c'est sûr que l'académie, les travaux universitaires sont très importants pour s'il y a des thèses qui se font sur des auteurs, et plus les travaux sont importants, et plus l'auteur est important. So yes, I do believe that academic work is important because it renders, uh, it renders, it gives visibility to a written work. Um, obviously, you need, you need a lot of um, of academic work in order to make one particular work of art visible. Um, And universities have their own policies. They do not always encourage um, uh, studies on, um, on all writers. They, they, they kind of choose the writers that, that are going to be um, dissected, if you want. Um, the, the real question is that um, I believe that um, a work of art, a, a literary work, becomes important when it is um, when it is read by what what Habib is calling privileged readers. These are readers that can go into the subtlety of uh, of a work. So, for example, he gives the example uh, of Malarmé in the 19th century, and he says Malarmé was only read by about a hundred people back then. Nowadays, Mallarmé is considered as one of the greatest French poets ever. The same thing for Rimbaud and Verlaine. Uh, why have they become important? Because they were, back then, they were only written, read uh, by maybe, uh, what, 20 people? But these people were privileged readers. That means that they could understand the subtlety of their texts and talk about them. Um, but yes, obviously, uh, in today's world, The more uh, academic work there is on one particular author, then uh, the likelier it is that that author will be considered as an important writer, or uh, the work itself as an important work. Do we have more questions, please? Thank you. If it's any consolation to the Maltese, you don't have to come from a tiny island to be considered exotic. I come from India and I get exactly the same thing. If you don't fall into the stereotype, uh, there's a problem and you have to do a lot of explaining. So I mean that in a consolatory sense. But my question has to do, um, and I'm, I'm sure any of you can answer it, because what's come up in the discussion is the ways in which universality is a function of accessibility, transportability, identifiability, so you identify with the work. I liked what you said about the reader universalizing it because he or she makes it her own. And therefore, what is potentially strange becomes familiar. My question has to do with how do you regard the role that particularity has to play in making universality possible? Because I do believe that when we translate, we translate particularities. And very often, I, I grew up in Bengal. Uh, Russian literature came from very far away. It was translated. It became very familiar to me. Um, but it was the strangeness that I wanted to inhabit. It wasn't, the, it wasn't closeness. So uh, if any of you could reflect on the relationship, if any, that you perceive between Universal, uh, universality in literature, if at all, being achieved by the excellent rendering of the particular that brings the strange close to you. Can I just say, yeah, um, so Garcia Marquez, 
wrote somewhere that in order to be to write something universal, you need to be as local as possible. Uh, I'm a little bit in two minds about it. I can't remember who I was talking to a few days ago about universality and so on. A friend of mine, but I can't remember who. Anyway, because they're probably here and they say, "Hey, you said that five. I said that five days ago, or whoever." But um, what was it? Sorry, I'm quite tired. Uh, yeah, but of course, Garcia Marquez, he created a fictional world, the world of Macondo. And it's, that, that helps it to become universal, the fact that it's imaginary, it's a place that doesn't exist. It's based on reality, but he created a whole world. And it's easier for a created world to become universal because it's then imagined by the reader. The reader already knows that it's an imaginary place. Mm -hmm. I think the same would go for, if any of you are familiar with the novels of uh, Andrea Camilleri, of um, the Commissario Montalbano. Montalbano, he creates um, a fictional city called Vigata, which we now know is based on Porto Empedocle, but the fact that he creates this whole uh, town and, uh, and surroundings and all the people within it helps it to become universal because it's programmed in his mind. Um, how particular can one get um, the first, my first acquaintance with poetry was um, when I was nine years old and my brother bought me a book called Swahili Songs of Love and Passion. It was translated in English and Swahili. Um, I loved it so much, it inspired me to write a poem dedicated to my mother. So that evening, she came into the kitchen with my sisters and they sat down and I said, I've got a poem for you, mom. Everybody's excited. She thinks her son is very intelligent. And this poem went something like this. Dearest mother, you are beautiful as the snowflakes of Siberia. Everybody knows where you are, but no one dares. My mother listened to this poem. She left and she went into my room and packed my bag and she kicked me out of the house. That's how I experienced my first exile. But this is the effect that translation had for me. Swahili songs of love and passion. You can look it up. Amazing. Through reading, we discover what it is to be human in all its possibilities, uh, in all the situations, in living now, living in the past, living in the future. Um, I think of, um, I th I'm thinking of one of my favorite authors, uh, David Mitchell, who loves to explore this. One of the best examples would be Cloud Atlas, where he sees a connection between different characters living in different uh, centuries. And perhaps, uh, as Sampurna pointed out, this is, this is something which uh, comes close to this definition of universality in the sense that uh, the, we have this huge jigsaw puzzle which we try to, you know, we're trying to uh, find all these different pieces and little by little we're trying to find this picture, discover this um, uh, uncover really, uncover this picture of what it is to be human and it will take forever and still we will not uncover it but w maybe we come close, closer and closer to, to, to seeing clearly what this picture would look like and through literature obviously and through uh, literature about um, literature coming from foreign cultures, uh, realities which are very different to us, maybe in translation, maybe not. Uh, and still, you still read something that sounds familiar or feels familiar, even though everything else is foreign. And perhaps uh, I think this would be the, this is a very um, honest way of looking at literature um, as having this universal aspect uh, in it. 
euh, oui, euh, enfin, le problème de l'universalité, là, je vais... Euh, C'est un problème que se posent les écrivains des pays dominés. Un, un écrivain américain qu'on vous... J'ai rencontré, il dit, ben, je suis euh, écrivain américain, poète américain, poète français. Et euh, j'ai beaucoup d'amis maghrébins, algériens, m'ont dit, tu es écrivain. Ah non, non, je ne suis pas un écrivain algérien, je suis un écrivain universel. Mais l'universalité n'existe pas en soi. On appartient, bon, je suis écrivain algérien, moi je, je suis écrivain algérien, j'écris en français. Après, l'universalité, en fait, les écrivains qu'on dit universels sont des écrivains locaux. Molière est un écrivain local. Racine est un écrivain local. Shakespeare est un écrivain local. Ils n'ont parlé que de leur petit patelin, de leur lieu. Mais l'universalité, elle a été atteinte parce que c'est des pays qui ont dominé le monde et qui ont imposé leur, leur particularité comme étant universelle. Alors, quand on écrit, je pense que le, le problème, et, et surtout parce que c'est lié au marché, euh, peut-être, je ne sais pas comment c'est dans la langue anglaise, mais la langue française, elle est très discriminante. Les auteurs français, vous avez ceux qui sont reconnus, les auteurs français, et tous les auteurs francophones. Ah, celui-là, c'est un écrivain euh, belge, c'est un écrivain breton, ou c'est un écrivain congolais. Donc, c'est second. Et, et en général, comme c'est des écrivains qui vivent en France, la majorité des écrivains francophones d'Afrique vivent en France. Et certains même ont la nationalité française, même la plupart ont la nationalité française, mais ils ne sont pas reconnus comme auteurs français de langue française. Et leur langue elle est toujours soupçonnée de quelque chose de particularisme. Un écrivain français de souche ne se pose pas la question s'il est universel ou pas. Il écrit, il écrit en français, point. Mais c'est le fait d'avoir mis d'un côté à la limite, l'écrivain français est aussi un écrivain francophone. Tous ceux qui écrivent en français sont des francophones. Or, on distingue français francophone et ceux qui sont dans le français sont dans l'universel. Ce Pascal Casanova, quand elle parle de la République universelle des lettres. Et pour être dans la République universelle des lettres, en France, ben, les chemins sont très tortueux. Je pense que je pourrais avoir la formule pour un travail multi-piece de travail qui entre. Ah, désolé, désolé. Parce que je vais faire le prêt. I think the, 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 the question of, universal, of universality is directly linked um, to a country being dominated. Um, if you're an American, you won't ask yourself that question. If you're writing within a culture that is a dominant culture, you don't ask yourself that question. But if when Habib asks um, other um, writers from Algeria, Um, how they consider themselves, they say, uh, I'm a universal writer. Whereas Habib says, no, you are an Algerian writer. I am an Algerian writer. Molière was a local um, writer. Racine was a local writer. Shakespeare was a, a local writer. They were all talking about the world they knew, this little world they knew about what was happening uh, there and then. Um, now, The, the French language is a discriminatory language. There is, on the one hand, there are those French uh, writers, like writing, they, they are French. On the other, on the other hand, there, there are the Francophone writers, which includes Belgian writers, people coming from Congo, Congolese, and somehow, all these Francophone writers are considered as second class, even when they're living in France. And so these are the writers who would ask themselves the, the question about, um, is what I'm writing universal? Can it be universal? Even when I'm writing about particularities, as Samporna was saying, uh, but the French writer would not even ask himself or herself that question. In reality, though, the French writer is as francophone as any other writer writing in French, but, but not coming from France. Um, so he says, if you want to become part of this republic, 
uh, that Casanova was talking about. In France, at least, um, it's a very tortuous um, process. Thank you. Well, okay. oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I want to apologize first of all because Nadia is such a good interpreter that she made herself invisible. <laughs> That's why I, I forgot that you had to interpret. <laughs> so, but what, what, what I wanted to say, what I started saying was, um, one, based on what we've been saying, one possible formula for a Maltese piece of work that can enter the world canon, right, is create a fictional Maltese village or town, or maybe a fictional island, you can put it above Gozo or below Marsa Schlock, or in Shaira with land reclamation, uh, make all the characters and the action and the customs as particular as possible, get it translated, and then wait for 500 PhD theses to be written about it. 